millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. So you're staring at seemingly a menu of 401k investment choices or a 403b, and you have no idea what to choose. What do these funds even mean? How are they going to impact me? And can I just close my eyes and pick a few and go with that? Please, please don't do that. I'm Shauna Compton Game. This is Millennial Money. And today we are talking how to foolproof your 401k with Harris and Greg, who just recently wrote an awesome book, Common Financial Sense. And they're going to help us demystify some of the common investing myths and how in the world you should think about your 401k. Millennial Money with Shauna Compton Game. It will expand your brain. Hi, this is Elton John here. Throughout my US tour last year, we heard from thousands of fans that financial security and financial planning are hugely important to them. So important that David and I are continuing this vital conversation into 2023. Together with the Alliance for Lifetime Income, I'm spreading the word about the importance of protected income, which is money you're guaranteed to get. Like me, I'm sure you have big plans for your next chapter. Protected income from an annuity helps ensure you have all your bases covered so you can have the financial freedom to tick off your bucket list. The first step is to decide what's on your bucket list. Then meet with your financial advisor to ask if you have protected income and get their help making a plan that fits your unique financial goals. Join me and my friends at the Alliance for Lifetime Income. Together, we can help make financial freedom in retirement a reality for more Americans, starting with you. Go to protectedincome.org today. So before we get into all of this demystification of 401k. Uh, We have another Ask Shauna question, and this one actually came from an anonymous listener. And just a reminder, if you have a question and you don't want me to say your name, I don't have to say your name. Just make sure and tell me that in the email. But don't let that stop you from sending in your question. We have so many amazing questions from people actually all around the world. And I think that's great. It really shows how personal finances, it's universal. And at the bottom, at the core, we're all trying to do the same things. We're all trying to be better budgeting, saving, paying off debt, planning for our future, and really putting our money to work so that we can just live the life we want to live. Because I, I really feel at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. It's not about all these crazy financial strategies, although a lot of them do help you get financially to a place you want to be, but it's really not that complicated. It, it really is, it's simple and it's always going back to the basics, but it's always keeping in mind, how is your money helping you get where you want to go? And the first question, of course, is figuring out where the heck do you want to go? Like, what do you want your life to look like? What is that vision? You may not be able to get there right now. It may take you some time, but okay, great. So let's get your money 
pointed in the direction of helping you get there. And just cut out all the crap, cut out all the fluff, cut out all the comparison and, um, you know, just dial into how to make this work for you. I know that took me many, many years to figure out like, oh, aha, that's the secret. Like when people do that, that's when the magic happens, regardless of their salary, regardless of what's in their bank account, regardless of their history. It really is that I think sweet spot that that makes everything work. That's not what the question is about, sort of. It sort of actually is what the question about. But anyway, I'm just going on a little rant. So <laughs> I will, uh, I'll spare you from a further rant. So the question says, I'm not sure if this will ever make it on your podcast. Yes, yes, it did make it on the podcast. But I have a question about pension plans and if they're really worth it. I currently work for a state university and a major benefit that they try to sell is a pension plan. Employees who work for a certain amount of years, usually upwards of 30 years, will receive a set amount in retirement based on their total years of service and age at retirement. The set amount is the average of your highest three years of salary. This seems like a good benefit, but the downside is mediocre to low pay, especially when compared to other companies. Additionally, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area and it's really expensive here. Cost of living is really high and there's additional pressure when a lot of my friends work for startups or private companies that offer very large salaries and their own benefits. Example, stock options, student loan support, etc. So my question is, is it really worth it to have a pension plan as a benefit versus having a larger salary and saving for retirement that way? I hope my question makes it somewhere because a lot of my colleagues, also millennials, are in my situation and wonder if this is all worth it. This is such a great question. I'm so happy you wrote in this question. I know that there's probably somebody else listening that this will resonate with. And I think this is what's really tricky about personal finance because it really is personal, you know, and you get in a lot of situations in life, at least in my experience and the people that I've been exposed to where you're having to pick kind of at a fork in the road. You know, do I go right? Do I go left? You can see pros and cons on each side of those different forks, if you will, and and trying to decipher and trying to make a decision of what is the quote unquote right decision, the right way to go can be really tricky because the problem is, is that Nobody can really answer that question for you. The best they can do is provide you with some sort of, I don't know, food for thought of thinking about, okay, how would you even go about evaluating this? So I think that's just, it really comes down to your personality and what you feel most comfy with. And I know that that doesn't, it probably isn't the magic answer that you want to hear, but that that really is the truth. You know, what kind of, personality are you when it comes to finance, when it comes to risk, when it comes to um, anxiety and stress and, and pressure and, you know, all of those things. I think we have to evaluate when we're making decisions like this because I know in in my past, I've made some career decisions because I thought, well, that's what I'm supposed to do. You know, I'm a competitive person and I do like risk. So sometimes I take on more risk than maybe I should. And sometimes I push myself in a direction because I'm like, well, that's what I'm supposed to do. That's what my peers are doing. That's what other people are doing. And then I think, wait a minute, this isn't actually what's right for me or what fits with my personality. So, you know, getting a a pension plan is really rare these days. So pension plans were around, certainly for our grandparents, some of our parents might have had that, especially if you had older parents or if you're um, kind of an upper millennial uh, as I am, or you're in that zennial range, uh, you know, pension plans might have been something that your, your parents had. And, you know, a lot of companies don't have those anymore. That was really the reason that 401ks got kind of their thrust in the marketplace was because Companies were like, you know, we don't want to take on the risk of having to provide long-term benefits to our employees after they've stopped working for the rest of their life. It became uh, just a big liability for companies. They couldn't fund it anymore. And so 401ks really kind of 
you know, came thrusting onto the scene because what it did was take the risk out of the company's hands and put it in your hands, the employee's hands, and said, okay, now you get to fund your retirement based off of your salary and you get to make investment choices and you get to decide how much of your salary you want to put in your 401k. And at the end of the day, if you go to retire and you've got a million dollars in there, great. If you've got $50,000, great. That's your own doing. But a pension plan really provides, in my opinion, a more conservative likelihood that you're going to receive a set amount of benefits in retirement, regardless of the market ups and downs. So if you're the type of person that is conservative, that likes having that sense of comfort that when you stop working after 30 years or whatever that time period is, you're going to be receiving a portion of your salary for the rest of your life and that makes you feel good. You don't have to think about it. The guesswork is gone. Then that might be a good choice for you, regardless of the fact that you're giving up maybe some pay advances, things like that. You know, if you work at a university, I don't know, maybe you have summers off, maybe you have more flexibility. I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what your position is, but, you know, all of those things I think you have to think about when you're making this decision. But, if you're more of a risk taker, the idea of a 401k, stock options, et cetera, that might make more sense. I'm, I will say one thing about stock options, though. You know, those things, they aren't guaranteed. And someone I'm close to actually worked at a company for 11 years, had stock options. They were a major part of their salary. They had a super high level job and they were laid off without notice. And so those stock options were completely worthless. And I, I've had that happen with a lot of people in my kind of network of peers, friends, family, whatever um, it may be, is that a lot of times, especially startups, promise a lot of stock options. Fantastic if the company goes... Um, <sighs> I'm just, I'm trying to say this like as um, middle of the road as possible. You know, it's fantastic if the company goes public, you know, the stock options are great. But if the company doesn't and you get laid off or you change jobs, those stock options, they don't mean a lot to you. So, you know, also with a 401k, you take on some risk. You take on that risk of picking picking the funds, of investing each month, you know, taking on the ups and downs of the market. Will you be ahead if you had a higher salary than if you took the lower salary in the pension? I don't know. You know, that's kind of that crystal ball um, <laughs> figuring out that nobody can really figure out. You kind of have to go with your gut on this. You kind of have to go with what type of person I am and how does each of these options make me feel. Um, again, this is why this money stuff is not one size fits all. We're all going to have a different take on a question like this. And I think another thing, you know, is, is trying to not get, I know it's hard, but trying to not get caught up in the peer pressure or the comparison, you know, figure out at the end of the day, what is going to make you the happiest, a more conservative approach with a defined benefit option, with the pension option, where, you know, you know, you're going to get a specific amount of benefit or you want to take things in your own hands with another job and you want to kind of roll the dice a little bit and, and see where you end up. You know, either choice is a great choice, but it really depends on who you are, uh, what's going to make you sleep easier at night, what's going to make you happier and, you know, what's the vision for your life and w which of those choices really aligns with that particular vision. I know that's, again, does not exactly answer your question, but um, I, I sort of feel like I can't say it enough of that so much of this is a personal choice and you got to do some gut checking and you got to do some evaluation of yourself and remove everybody else from it. Remove whoever you're with in a relationship, remove your parents, remove your friends, just remove everyone. And at the end of the day, figure out what makes it work for you. So I'm super excited about today's podcast. Um, Harris and Greg are financial experts, and they've come out with this new book, Common Financial Sense. And we're covering a lot in this in this episode, but we're really focusing on how to foolproof your 401k. What is this thing, your 401k? How do you figure out how to make this thing work? 
why you should be investing in this thing. And then we're also going to be demystifying some of the common investing in 401k myths. A lot of the questions that you've sent me, I'm kind of throwing back at Harris and Greg saying, hey, let's let's either debunk this or let's call this truth and uh, get this information out to you because it's important to figure out, hey, how do I hack my 401k? How do I get this thing working the way I want it to? And this book is just jam-packed with so much amazing info that I know you're going to love this one. So before we hear from Harrison Gregg, a quick word from our podcast episode sponsor. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps, but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Hiring used to be so hard. There were all of these job sites. You had stacks of resumes, and it was just a confusing review process. But today, hiring can be easy, and you only have to go to one place to get it done, ZipRecruiter.com slash MyMoney. The cool thing is ZipRecruiter sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards, but they don't just stop there. They have this powerful matching technology. So a ZipRecruiter scans these thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience, and then they actually invite them to apply for your job. As the applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one and then spotlights the top candidates so you never miss a great match. ZipRecruiter is so effective that 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. I know when we were hiring for Millennial Money, we tried to do it on our own first, and let's just say that didn't work out so well. ZipRecruiter was such an amazing find. With results like that, it's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is actually the highest rated hiring site in America. And right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash MyMoney. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash MyMoney. My money, M Y M O N E Y. ZipRecruiter.com slash my money because ZipRecruiter is honestly the smartest way to hire, no matter the size of your business. Everyone knows that putting money aside in savings is really important. But then what? Should you keep your savings locked in a CD for a higher rate or keep them liquid in a money market? Can your checking account help you save too? Or is it about creating the right combination? We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about the savings options that are right for you. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com. Member FDIC. So Harris and Greg, I am so excited to have you both join us on the podcast. I know you have a wealth of financial experience, so hopefully we can uh, gleam some of your expertise for the listeners today. That sounds like a plan. Sounds good. So you have a new book, uh, Common Financial Sense. It's all about 
uh, the simple strategies for 401k and 403b retirement plan investing. But to start off, you know, I really wanted to pick your brain. Why is retirement plan investing, why does it seem so confusing for people? What do you think is the is kind of the big myth about that? Well, it's very interesting. It starts with the fact that there are basically three taboos in American society, uh, money, sex, and death. And if you're going to talk about retirement planning, you deal with two of the three, and frankly, you, you don't even get the good one. <laughs> So, because um, the, the, the big question in life is, you go to retirement, is how much money am I going to need to retire? Well, phenomenal question, but tell me how long you're going to live, and we'll know how to spread that money around. Whoa, you know, mortality. Nobody, that's a heavy subject. Nobody wants to deal with that. So, uh, don't talk to me about Chapter 87. I'm barely on Chapter 22 or Chapter 23. I, I can't think about Chapter 75 or 87. So, it's... It, it's very daunting. The language, unfortunately, of the 401k industry can be daunting. So it's important to describe things in English. A lot of the terminology has, has multiple meaning, meanings. Uh, we talk about things in terms of uh, risk. Risk means different things to different people. We talk about things in terms of conservative, moderate, and aggressive. They mean different things to different people. It's not like we're explaining or describing what an orange is or what an avocado is or what a pen or a stapler is where most people are going to understand what you're talking about. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, you brought up a good point. I mean, especially for the listeners of this podcast, you know, many of them are, you know, mid 20s, maybe early 30s. And the concept of retirement just seems so far away. And I'm sort of convinced that, you know, retirement for a 25 year old, say, isn't really going to even look like, you know, retirement of maybe our parents in the future. But to kind of argue this point, you know, why does it make sense to start investing early, even if you're so afraid of, of taking any risk? Primarily because when you're young, and so we have um, people in their 20s working uh, with us in our in our firm, and they saw this chart uh, that just blew their mind. One thousand dollars invested in the stock market ninety years ago is five million dollars. Ten thousand is fifty million dollars. So what their aha moment was, and they're both twenty five by the way. What their aha moment was was, let me start with something so that I can get this compounding machine going, uh, especially if they can do it in their Roth 401k, not to throw a term at you, but this tax-free growth part of the 401k, so that when their their grandparents age, and their grandparents are in their are 80, they have all this tax-free money. Because every young person and every middle-aged person knows somebody that's retired that is broke. And they all say, I wish I could have done something different when I was younger. So it's really getting young people to understand how money grows rapidly, especially when you're young. Yeah, exactly. And it can be, you know, a, a relatively small amount of money when you're young. I think the, the perception is thinking like, oh, my gosh, I have to invest in my 401k so much money that, you know, I'm not going to be able to pay my student loans or pay my bills. And that's not the case, correct? Correct. If you can just start with. 1%. Just start with 1%. And so 1% on a $30,000 salary is 300 bucks a year, 25 bucks a month, which is $3 with $25 a month, a dollar a day. Start with a dollar a day. Spend a dollar a day less and start that and kind of see what happens. And over time, that just keeps compounding, compounding and compounding. Yep. And it's the, the beauty of the compounding that, that, makes it so big. And I think it's it speaks to those those charts you were talking about, how when you can sort of in a picture form even see how your money can be transformed, it, it starts to become like a powerful concept. Yes, because they can see it. So they can see, so they can, so the big thing that, uh, especially, um, so with our young people here, it's really exciting to see them have that aha moment. And it's really, they play games now. Uh, and they can play, they play games with each other, which is, hey, I saved $30 this month uh, in my 401k. What did you do? And they kind of set competitions with each other. 
And what we all need is like a little competition or a little game. Uh, so it's how much can you look, how much less can you spend and can you save that? Whether it's in a 401k plan or in your IRA or just in an investment account, right? Just a personal investment account. How can you create a game to compete with yourself or someone else to see who can invest or save the most? And in the book, we talk about a game. We call it the dollar game. And Harris is going to explain it. Quite frankly, it's, 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 it's brilliant in its simplicity. It, the idea is you start out in week one and you set a dollar aside. In week two, you set an additional dollar. In week three, an additional dollar. And you do that over 52 weeks by either maybe uh, uh, filling your own uh, you, you know, Yeti or Nalgene bottle with water instead of buying bottled water. It could be taking the office coffee instead of stopping by at Starbucks. Any way you can find a way to scrounge up an extra buck a week. At the end of a year, you've actually set aside between thirteen and $1,400. And if all you do is have continue at that level and don't increase your savings anymore, you're still going to have six figures in your retirement account by the time you retire if you're starting in your 20s. But that's where it gets very interesting. If you're able to put away that dollar a week, continue with it. And I'm not suggesting you drive your HR people crazy by increasing your contribution. <laughs> week. But what that really gets down to is basically saying every quarter you increase it by maybe fifteen dollars or ten dollars. So uh, basically, so that every every three months you're increasing it by ten or fifteen dollars, and after a while it starts to add up to a lot, a lot of money. And you're right, you got to pay your student loans back. That's an issue. You might have a car loan. You've got rent. There's a lot of things that are pressing for your money. But there's a couple of 401k savings hacks. There's a lot of 401k savings hacks in the book. But there's a couple that we can talk about, frankly, right now, if you like. Oh, yeah. I love hacks. Go for it. Right. So the first thing is, uh, is, is pay yourself first. Fill out a budget. There, there are all kinds of different budgeting apps. We have a budgeting uh, a, 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 you know, link to a budget where you can, if you don't pay yourself first, you never get around to it. Because at the end of the month, you say, I'll pay myself with whatever's left over. There's nothing left over. Come on. We all know that. Uh, <laughs> And so, and so you pay yourself first. Very, very important. So something as simple as creating a budget is an incredible, uh, is an incredible hack. Another great hack is the idea of by putting your money in on a regular basis through your payroll, uh, you're able to have your money going on, on every two weeks or every week or at least once a month. And that's called dollar cost averaging. We are able to take advantage of the swings in prices in the stock market. It almost, it really doesn't matter what the prices of stocks are this week or next month or even next year, especially for people uh, who are not going to be retiring in the next few years. So uh, by dollar cost averaging, you tend to take advantage of getting the great companies of America on sale when the market actually does poorly. It's a very ironic situation that we, it's the only market in the world where everything's on sale. Nobody wants to buy it. Any other market, everybody wants to buy. So it's important to keep that uh, in, in, in mind as well. Oh, those are those are awesome hacks. Yeah. Um, you know, and one of the topics you explore in the book that I know we've gotten a lot of questions about. I've I've covered this a lot, had a lot of different people talk about this, but um, you know, the the concept of should I choose a four oh one K, should I choose a Roth IRA? Or if I have the option to choose a Roth four oh one K, why in the heck would I choose that? Can you walk us through just a little bit about, you know, what are maybe some of the differences and what would the evaluation process be for someone? So if you work for a company that you really believe in or trust that they're doing the right thing, it's really about the employee or the person's ability to pick investments because Wall Street makes everything so confusing. Just not a, just retirement accounts, just invest in general. It's all about confusion out there. So if you trust your company that they're doing the right job, then the 401k is probably the first place to go because um, they're probably um, reviewing the accounts. They have a fiduciary obligation, which means they have a legal obligation to kind of review everything. So I would definitely say that look at the 401k, especially if they're putting some money in for you as a match. So a lot of companies are doing, uh, you know, 50% of 6%. So if you put away 6%, they're going to put, put away 3%. Some companies just put away 3% for you. Uh, and that's a different kind of a match. But the match is important because it's free money. So if you're 
uh, if your company has a 401k, you first want to find out, are they putting money away for you? Especially if you participate, it's free money. Don't leave free money on the table. So that's the big, that's the big benefit. Then it's, well, do I want a Roth 401k or a pre-tax 401k? And it's really, when do you want to pay your income taxes? So let's just kind of think through that. If you're making some money and you put away $1,000 uh, pre-tax, maybe it's going to save you 100 or $150 or $200 in income taxes. But when you take it out in retirement, you pay income taxes then. If you put it into the Roth, you pay some taxes now, that extra 100 or 200 bucks now in the $1,000. But when you have 100000 or 200000 or 300 or more in your retirement account, you pull that out tax-free. So the benefit of the Roth is you pay a little bit of income taxes now while you're working. So it's tax-free money at retirement. Great. So, you know, just kind of, I think, the best advice uh, that I always try to give, and I think this is what you're saying, too, is is to actually figure out, you know, kind of what what is your goal? What are you comfortable with? And, um, you know, definitely asking those questions of HR, you know, is there a match? And, and trying to get as much information ahead of time so you can make an educated decision. And just start. You know, what happens is people get so um, wrapped up in details they actually, uh, it's called, we call it paralysis through analysis. They get paralyzed because there's too much information. So they set it aside. Now, I'll look at it next week or I'll look at it next month. I just can't deal with it right now. So whatever decision you make or just start something and then it'll be okay. You know, a very wealthy person once told me, make a decision. And if it's the wrong decision, then change it and make it right. But at least make a decision and get going something whether it's a Roth IRA, regular IRA, foreign, just, just start and then it'll be okay. I love that advice. That is such great advice. And, you know, both of you have a lot of experience in this field. I'd love maybe if each of you could kind of give just the, the Cliff Notes version of your career and, you know, what really led you to write this book. Sure. So uh, Greg and I uh, were friends who were reunited uh, about uh, 30 years ago. And from day one, we, we just always seem to see the world the same way professionally. Uh, we both built our organization based on how we ourselves would want to consume the services that we offer. And that has always been our driving mantra. What's best for the client? What's best for the client? What's best for the client? So we've built our, and that, therefore we're fiduciaries, we're, we, which means that we, we keep the client's interests uh, first and only in our minds. That's all that matters. Whatever is best for the client is what's best for us. You would think that that's common sense, but that just isn't the case in this industry. Uh, and so, and so that's, that's how we came together, and we've been working for, for nearly 30 years together, uh, and, and it's been wonderful. Uh, as far as the book, we, about a year and a half ago, after years of our clients coming to us saying, you, know, you guys make it so easy to understand. Thank you for explaining things in plain common sense. Um, you really should take these stories and write them down. So we put that in the back of our minds and we set out to see, you know, just exactly what is in the canon of investment literature. And we come to find out there's absolutely, despite the fact that we're, we haven't been nationally recognized, experts in the 401k and 403b field, we were stunned to learn that there's absolutely no literature for the basic 401k or 403b investor. And the 403b is simply the, the nonprofit version of a, a company version of a 401k. And we were just so stunned. And most people in our industry get it wrong. They think that people want to learn about investing. The average 401k investor doesn't want to learn investing. They want to learn, what do I need to do with my 401k? <laughs> because they understand they have to set money aside. They get the benefits of putting money aside. They get the benefits of the match once it's explained to them. But then they're given 30 or 40 or even 20 choices, and that's where the paralysis sets in. So we said about it, we said, hey, what if we put together a basic 401k primer, a how-to guide that really said, answers not necessarily how to invest, although we think we do a good job of that as well. We also said, how do we just help people deal with their 401k? How can somebody just buy a book and, and be able to basically figure it out and self-teach the entire thing for themselves? Because the only other book that ever came out about this, uh, and I'm sure you could guess the title, it was 401ks for dummy, Dummies, but it was more, more than 20 years ago, uh, written by a fellow named Ted Bennett, who actually invented the 401k plan. 
and it's a fantastic book. But being 18 years old, that's four presidents, two tax changes, um, two market crashes ago. I mean, what could go wrong at 300 pages? No one's reading a 300-page book anymore. So we said, let's do this a short, sweet, to the point, uh, short chapters, quick chapters, get in, make our point, move on to the next idea. And best of all, uh, that fellow, Ted Bennett, who invented the 401k plan and did write 401ks for dummies, was kind enough to write the forward to our book. So he actually has a very thoughtful forward in the book as well. Wow, that's so remarkable to know that there isn't even that much literature on the subject. I mean, it just it sort of blows my mind since it's it feels like such a cornerstone to to financial planning. Um, are there any other chapters that uh, really stood out to you when you were writing them? You like, oh, God, this is just such an awesome chapter. Well, we we like to talk in, I believe it's chapter five verses is one that is interesting to us because again, it's about using words and understanding what they mean. And we talk about easy versus simple. They sound so similar, but they really are different things. Losing weight is easy, right? You eat less and you exercise more. Is it simple? I don't think so. It's a two plus billion dollar industry. Uh, Scary versus dangerous. There's lots of things that are scary, but frankly, they're not dangerous. Sometimes the stock market seems easy or it seems simple. It seems scary or it seems dangerous, but these are words that you have to understand uh, clearly. So we talk about that. Of course, we talk about needs versus wants. Let's start with the basics. If you can't put you know, roof over your family's head, clothes on your family's back, you can't put food in your belly, then a 401k is not, you're not ready for that. You have to take care of the essentials first. But assuming you've got that taken care of, then it's not really, a, oh, I need this or, oh, I need that. It's, I want that. And understanding the difference between a need and a want. And other than that, we're also chapter uh, eight, I believe, where it talks about a lot of different things, uh, specifically about what you can control versus what you can't control. We spend almost all of our time and all of our energy uh, focusing on investments and investor returns. And you turn on you know, CNBC or Fox News Channel or any one of the, the business channel, Bloomberg, any, you see the lips moving. It almost sounds like English. But it really isn't. They're speaking financial ease. It really is not common sense English. So people spend a lot of time uh, fretting and concerned over the investments or what the stock market's doing today or next week or this or that. Frankly, you could, there are four other variables that are so much more important and, frankly, that you can control. And those are the things that you should be looking at for. And that's what we discuss in Chapter 8. We discuss about how much determining how much risk you can take and what risk means to you. For example, the stock market going up and down from week to week or month to month, that's volatility to us. That's not risk. Risk is you're 75 years old uh, and you have, you're physically healthy, you're mentally healthy, and you've got no more money. That is risk. Uh, you can, you can, second thing is you can determine how, how much time you have to invest. And if, if you're young, you've got many, many years. You have that gift of time. And very, very important, your emotions can be controlled. And that is really important because... What sets in almost immediately after we make any kind of investment is worry. There's an old Irish proverb that says, worry is interest paid on a debt not yet incurred. So most of what we worry about never comes to fruition. Does the stock market go up? Yes, it does. Does it go down? Yes, it does. But historically, it's always gone up again. So there's no reason to not think why it wouldn't come back up again if it goes down temporarily. And the fourth thing you can control, believe it or not, even in a 401k, you can control the cost of your investments because there's three different types of uh, investment costs. You've got the ones that are known, that are stated. You've got the ones that are hidden. They're hard to find, but they can be dug out. And most importantly, it's the opportunity cost. What is the opportunity cost of being in an investment that's appropriate for somebody in my situation? Most people don't match up their time frame and their risk profile with the proper investments. Those are some awesome nuggets of advice. Um, Okay, I'd love to run through some common myths that are out there about 401ks and, and investing and and either debunk them or or call them truths. Um, the first one is, you know, that I have to be an expert to to start investing. Uh, no. So the the what's really happened now is the majority of 401ks have something called a target date fund or a target risk fund. All oh, that most of them that we see are target date funds. What that means is. If you're 25 years old and you say, well, you know what, I'm going to probably have to work 40 more years. Ugh. So then you say, well, it's 2018, 40 more years is 2058. 
you can pick the 2060 or the 2055 fund, set it, and then forget it. So you can pick the target date fund to correspond with the year you're going to retire and then set it and forget it. Don't have to worry anymore. And the reason why you can set it and forget it is because the investment company that's managing the money for you understands that this is money for somebody who's going to retire in 2055 to 2060. So as time goes on, they're going to become more aggressive while you're young and less aggressive as you get older. Set it and forget it. Awesome. Uh, Okay, the next one is something I hear a lot. A lot of uh, listeners write in and ask me this question. And it's, I own a home, so I don't need a 401k because my home is going to be my retirement. So that's really... May be true or may not be true. So if you live in an area that homes are expensive, like California is expensive, New Jersey, New York, you know, expensive homes, what happens in New Jersey, a lot of people uh, in retirement will sell their home and move south to a less expensive place to live, Carolinas, Florida, whatever, right? But if you live down there, where do you sell your house and move to? So it depends on the geographic area you're living in because most people don't want to leave their friends and family. And if they're lucky enough to have their house paid off in retirement and they don't have a mortgage, well, how do you get the money out of your house? You still need to live somewhere. You're going to go rent something for a lot of money. I mean, so that really doesn't work unless you literally can move, get up and move to a cheaper place and free up some of that money. Great point. I love that. Um, all right. How about um, I'm only going to lose money if I invest? Um, well, that, that seems to be the emotional roller coaster that a lot of people uh, mm. get on is what happens is they hear something. And the latest thing, what is Bitcoin, right? So not too long ago, people were investing in Bitcoin at like $20,000. Well, Bitcoin is under 7000 now. So what happens is people hear something, they get at the wrong uh, time. In fact, on page 85 of the book, it talks about the 20 year return of this, the 20 year annualized return of the stock market is 7.68%. And gold and then bonds, international stocks, oil, homes is 3.24% a year. Homes are only 3% a year appreciation over the past 20 years. The average investor makes a little over 2% a year because they hear something, so they buy it. Then it goes down. They're on the emotional roller coaster, and we have a whole discussion of the emotional roller coaster and a whole chart. It goes down. Then they sell it because they they think they made a mistake or they start getting fearful. They sell it for a loss. Then it keeps going down. Then it goes back up, and now they're angry. So that's why if you're in a 401k plan, you pick out the target date fund or something like that. You put money in. You set it and forget it and don't continue looking at it. Great point. And you make money over time. Yes, very important. You will make money over time. Okay, the last one is, I'm a freelancer and don't have access to a 401k, so I should just wait to invest because I don't have 401k as my option. Well, certainly you've got other options. If if you're you're self-employed, you could think about your own IRA. You can think about a Roth IRA. You can think about their solo case, their set plans. There's many, many options for tax-deferred savings for you. So if you're self-employed and you're a freelancer, you're part of the gig economy, um, you can actually open up your own 401k, and it's really inexpensive. And you can put away money into your own 401k. So you remember, an IRA, so if you're under 50, an IRA can put in like $5,500, right? So let's, whether it's a Roth IRA or a regular IRA, but let's say you said, but I really had a good year, and I can put away more than that, you know, I've been, you know, smiled on good fortune. You can open up your own individual 401k if you want. You don't need to work for a company. Yeah, such great advice. I love that. So many of the listeners are freelancers, self-employed, and, you know, it's tough tough figuring out what your what your options are. Well, Harris and Greg, this has been fabulous. So many gems of information you have dropped. Tell listeners where they can go to pick up the book and where they can go to find out more information about you both. Sure. You can pick up the book at Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com. The book is called Common Financial Sense, Simple Strategies for Successful 401k and 403b Retirement Plan Investing. You can reach out to us at uh, Harris at CFSIAS.com, Greg at Greg at CFSIAS.com. 
Our uh, web address, of course, is cfsis.com. We're also on LinkedIn. Feel free to follow us or wink in or if you have any questions, we, we, we are happy to answer them. And, and our parting thought today is um, the, the idea that um, we're living in an environment where every, every night there's an opportunity to do something, especially on the weekend night. So all of a sudden we start thinking about YOLO. You know, you only live once or FOMO. All my friends are going to be doing something. I've got to be out doing something with them as well. We've got to capture that that Instagram moment together this weekend. And the problem is, is YOLO and FOMO is expensive. It costs money, and that's good. But we want to throw another idea, another idea out there, and that's called hipster. How are you paying for that in retirement? How are you paying for that in retirement? Because we're going to want to YOLO and we're going to have FOMO in, you know, 30, 40, 50 years from now also. We're going to want to play then too. So we have to, we, if, even if we spend the quarters today, we have to save the nickels for tomorrow. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast episode and hopefully you gleamed a lot of tips to supercharge your 401k or maybe just get a little bit more interested in what the heck is going on with your 401k. As always, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Shauna Game. Hey, we're also on Spotify, so be sure to head on over there and check out all of your favorite Millennial Money episodes. And if you love this podcast, do me a favor, share it with your friends, shout it out on social media, and head on over to the link in the show notes to leave us a review. 